you're going to Ilha de Quiamada Grande, one of the most dangerous islands in the world. There, you find yourself among rainforests, huge rocks, and grasslands. The place is home to birds, locusts, and giant cockroaches. But there's one more animal, and because of it, the island got its notorious reputation. Snakes live there, and a lot of them. So many that the place is also known as Snake Island. Will you survive there? Located just 20 miles away from the coast of Brazil, the island has an area of 43 hectares, or over 100 acres. It probably got cut off from the mainland after the last ice age. The snakes were also separated from most other animal species. They didn't have competitors and had an unlimited source of food. In such a small area, there are up to 4,000 snakes. That's one snake for every 10 square feet. It would be a difficult feat not to come across a snake on this island. Not only is this snake, the golden lancehead, one of the most numerous on the island, but it's also a highly venomous pit viper species. And it's also one of the most venomous in all of Latin America. Its venom is so potent due to the isolation of the species, with only birds sharing the land with them. To catch these birds, the snake's venom needed to become extra strong. And indeed, since they got separated from their distant relatives, their venom has become up to five times more powerful. Most of the time, these snakes hide in the trees or amongst leaves on the ground. If you find yourself stranded here, you'll want to keep yourself a safe distance away. Snakes mainly use their sense of smell and rely on vibrations. If you get too close to one, either stand still or slowly walk away. If you make too many vibrations, this will make them feel threatened, causing them to strike. If you spot them a safe distance away, or if you're walking toward tall grass, stamp your feet a couple of times. This will notify snakes of your presence. They won't risk taking down prey larger than they are and will likely slither away. Carrying a stick is always a good idea, just in case you happen to come across a snake accidentally. This way, you'll have an extension of your arm that cannot be bitten. This simple thing might save your life. A stick with a V shape on the end will give you even more advantage. Even if a snake starts acting aggressively, holding it down will stop it in its tracks. But whatever happens, don't try to pick it up. Okay, but what if you get bitten? The chances are pretty high on this island, of course. First of all, don't try to get the venom out on your own. Make sure you call emergency services immediately. And once help is on the way, apply a wide bandage. A piece of clothing will do if you don't have anything else. Don't try to chase the snake trying to identify the species. Emergency services know how to figure out what venom it is. Now, just keep calm and wait for help. You might be wondering who you can call on this abandoned island. Well, since it's strictly prohibited to visit this place, there are signs advising to stay away all over the island, along with a number you can call if you run into trouble. Let's say you've successfully avoided getting bitten. The next thing to consider is what you can eat there. Snake Island was previously known as Ilha de Quiamada Grande, where Quiamada is Portuguese for forest being lit up or forest fire. The reason for that was the fact that the entire island was deliberately set on fire to make room for a banana plantation. Unfortunately, the banana business didn't turn out to be a success, probably because farmers got sick and tired of snakes. But some banana trees still thrive today, and they can provide you with some much needed nutrients. You'll also want some protein in your diet throughout your stay. Luckily, along with the snakes trapped on the island, there are also cockroaches. These giant prehistoric looking roaches come out at night to feed on plants. Get that barbecue started and enjoy the rare delicacy this island provides. A great way to survive on the island is to avoid it altogether. If by chance you happen to be sailing past, keep in mind that this place was once connected to the mainland. Rocks beneath the waves are very likely to damage the bottom of your boat if you get too close. Make sure you keep an appropriate distance when traveling past. Sure, this island is intriguing, but please remember that no matter how close you get to it, you won't be able to see snakes from the boat. You can only see these creatures if you get close enough, which you really shouldn't do. And it's not only reptiles that make this location dangerous. Pirates visit the island quite often. 
Not the sea shanty singing peg legged arbor pirates, but bio pirates who come there to capture the very thing that makes it so dangerous. They come there for snakes, to catch them and sell them illegally. Since the island got cut off around 11,000 years ago, the golden lance head has evolved within its own unique habitat. So, although there are many reptiles on this island, they're still an endangered species. Due to their limited numbers, their value is very high, reaching up to $30,000 on illegal markets, which gives biopirates the motivation to catch them. I can think of better ways to make a living. Anyway, let's say you've got all the resources necessary to survive in one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Do you think you would manage this feat? Perhaps you think it's impossible. You'd be surprised at how possible it can be, if you know what you're doing. It turns out many have visited this scary place before. Research teams often come there. They study the golden lancehead snake, its environment, and its food sources for conservation purposes. But scientists always make sure there's a doctor on the team. There's also a lighthouse on Snake Island. It had been operated by people until the 1920s. Then it became automated. One guess why. Brazilian authorities visit the lighthouse once a year to make sure it's still functional. Locals on the mainland know the reputation of the island, so the stories of people going missing are minimal. But one group of fishers once got too close to the island. As they were sailing along their normal route, they accidentally neared the shore. Their boat hit a rock under the waves and began filling with water. As the boat was quickly sinking, the men had only two options to try to survive in the rough sea or swim to the shores of Snake Island. It was a hard choice to make. After all, they had heard the stories, and it wasn't just about snakes. Rumor had it that the island was cursed. Regardless of the stories, the fishers chose to take their chances with Snake Island. After making it to the shore, they tried to be careful. Their knowledge of the island could help them survive. Most importantly, they knew to avoid the rainforest at all costs. As the men got hungry, they carefully walked along the edge of the forest, warily collecting bananas. They were mostly sitting, waiting, and conserving their energy. They could only drink water when it rained. It was just enough to sustain them. They slept on the beach, unprotected from the elements and weather. And all the time, they were so close to the comfort of the lighthouse or caves. They were probably overly cautious, but it was either enduring some discomfort or risking their lives for a dry bed. They didn't yield to the temptation. They managed to survive for three days without being bitten by a snake. After that, a passing boat finally rescued them. So now you know anything is possible. Octopuses have three hearts. Two of them pump blood to the gills, while the bigger heart circulates blood to the rest of their body. They also have nine brains. There's the large central one, but also each of their eight arms has a mini brain of its own, which is why they can act independently. Since each arm has its own brain, the central brain only needs to send a higher level signal to the arm. Things like, move to that nearby crevice, there might be a crab hiding inside. In the case of humans, the brain would guide and take control of each movement of our legs and arms. And with an octopus, arms act almost independently on their way to the crevice. It also tastes and feels with the suction cups on it. Since their arms are so independent, an octopus doesn't actually know where they are unless it sees them. The human body has an ability called proprioception. Thanks to it, we know where our arm is, even if we hold it, let's say, behind our back. 1816 is known as the year when summer didn't come. In April 1815, there was a massive explosion on Mount Tambora in Indonesia. It sent enormous clouds of volcanic ash up into the atmosphere. The majority of the northern hemisphere got covered with a shroud of dust and dirt and kind of refused to settle. In June of the following year, the cold winter didn't just come to an end. Frost damaged crops and snow and rain persisted during the whole summer. In Iceland, you'll find some of the most breathtaking sceneries on our planet. Jagged mountains, fjords, hot geysers, ice fields carved into the landscape. Stunning yet intriguingly black sand beaches, such as Reynisfjara Beach. 
Most of the sand on beaches is generally formed from rocks that have broken down because of weather changes and erosion through thousands or even millions of years. And on Rainisfjara, the sand is a striking black color, and that's because of volcanic activity. Lava came out of an erupting volcano, got to the surface, cooled, and then hardened in the Atlantic Ocean, creating such a fascinating black hue. This beach is so magically stunning, but it's also very dangerous because of its sneakier waves. That's when a few smaller waves join together into a single, really big one. This phenomenon can happen when ocean currents force waves together, or in the case of Rainisfera, when such waves come from an offshore underground cliff and get an even stronger pulling effect. Considering the ocean's low temperatures too, it's definitely better to just take pictures from a safe spot. Some trees talk to each other. Yeah, not the way we do, of course, but for example, acacia trees that grow over the African savanna can warn each other if there's something dangerous coming. When some animals, such as antelopes, gobble up its leaves, the tree immediately starts producing more tannin, which is toxic to animals. They also emit a special type of gas that travels through the air and warns other trees they should protect themselves too. You're stargazing, such a chill night, and then a flash of bright light streaks through the night sky. A shooting star, so cool! But what we see is not actually a star, although we call it that way. They're meteors, which are basically small chunks of dust and rock moving through space. As they're passing through our atmosphere, they cause something called friction when one thing rubs against another. And that's why they glow. Also, the friction causes heat. Dust and rocks get extremely hot as they fly through the atmosphere, and the heat makes them glow until the moment they burn out and turn into what we call the shooting star. Sunsets in deserts are extremely beautiful because of the spectacular colors they produce a bit more than elsewhere. Sunlight consists of various shades of the color spectrum. When the sun is high in the sky, these colors mix together and our eyes see them as white. But as the sun gets lower, its rays have to go through a thicker layer of atmosphere before they get to us. The atmosphere then scatters shorter wavelengths of light, like blue and purple, before we can even see them. That's why the longer orange and red wavelengths stand out. In urban environments, air pollution can make sunset colors duller than everywhere. The clean air in deserts allow the vivid colors coming from the sun to shine through at twilight. Also, the moisture, water vapor, and rain engorged clouds can mute the sunset's hues. Since there's no rain, clouds are thin and wispy, so they filter and reflect sunlight instead of blocking it. Bamboo grows really fast. It's actually the fastest growing plant on Earth, sometimes growing about 3 feet in just one day. You can find it in dense forests, where only a little light gets to the ground, which means bamboo is under strong pressure to reach the sunlight as quickly as it can. There's an underground stem that connects bamboo shoots to their parent plant, so the shoot doesn't really need leaves of its own until it gets to its full height. Also, bamboo grows faster than other plants because it doesn't waste its time and energy on growing rings that thicken the stalk. It's just a thin, hollow stick that grows straight up. You'll notice some of the big trees have shallow root systems, sometimes even 10 inches deep in the ground. The roots generally need access to oxygen and water, and they can mostly find it in special underground pockets called soil pores. When a tree has ideal moisture and soil conditions, it can send roots deeper down under the surface and get what it needs. But most of the time, conditions are not perfect, considering bedrock, stones, and compact soil that physically prevents the roots from going down. Such obstacles also prevent the roots from getting the needed oxygen. So, when life gets tough, the tree will take an easier option. Its roots will stay close to the surface and spread out in different directions. Drought conditions are another reason trees can have shallow root systems. By staying closer to the surface, they can take most of the rainfall collection. Plants are exposed to the sunlight most of the time, but they still don't get sunburned. They appeared on land about 700 million years ago, and one of the key things they needed to survive was something that would protect them against the ultraviolet rays coming from the sun. Those in the sea had seawater as protection. UV radiation is mostly responsible for sunburn, so land plants developed a special protein that detects it. 
this protein sends signals to the cells to protect the plant from the damage and effects of UV radiation. Basically, it's like they produce their own natural sunscreen. But this still doesn't mean they're 100% protected. You know that common belief that if you water plants in the midday sunshine, this can cause their sunburn? Some think droplets of water act as tiny lenses and then focus the sunlight onto the leaf surface. But they're not strong enough to actually focus sunlight from a water droplet onto the surface of a leaf. It's just that their natural sunscreen doesn't mean total protection. Too much exposure to UV radiation damages cells in the leaves and bark of the majority of plants. Earth's core is as hot as the surface of the sun. You'd think it could easily melt our entire planet, especially since the core is only 1,800 miles away from the surface. If the sun were so close, we'd be like french fries. But we're alive because the center of the sun is surrounded by a mantle of rock that's mostly solid. The crust we walk on actually floats on that mantle and protects us. If the sun was close, we'd only have empty space to protect us and you and I wouldn't be talking. Also, to melt the entire planet, you'd need way more energy than the heat in its core. Uh, now the first rule is not to panic, the guy says. He gives Michael a thick suit. The weather is hot here, and the outfit seems very warm. You can't go without it, he adds. Michael puts on the outfit and feels goosebumps all over his body. Why is it so cold? The guide explains this is a unique cooling cloth. It'll save Michael from heat stroke inside the cave. The guide gives him an oxygen tank and a mask. Are we gonna dive? Michael asks. No, but your lungs may fill up with water if you don't use it. Michael's knees are shaking with fear. He doubts this whole idea. Welcome to one of the most dangerous caves on the planet, the guy says as he enters the dark space at the foot of a mountain. This place is called Crystal Cave, and it's located in Mexico. Magma had leaked here from the hot bowels of our planet 26 million years ago. It was coming and cooling down again and again. There was so much magma that it formed a mountain. Along with magma, mineral-rich water got here. It had been seeping through the rock tunnels and had formed a cave under the hill. Then, something strange appeared in these hot waters. Something that seems to be from another planet. Michael is going down the rope. He illuminates the bottomless darkness with a flashlight. The air becomes hot and heavy. Microscopic particles of water are hovering here. Along with a guide, Michael descends to 980 feet. This is more than half of the Empire State Building's height. The air temperature goes up. It feels as if they were approaching the Earth's core. Finally, the descent ends, and they jump on solid ground. The guy puts on an oxygen mask and tells Michael to do the same. You can't breathe in such moist and acidic air. The lungs can fill with water, which will lead to disastrous consequences. The air here feels to Michael as if he's walking through a very thick fog. The temperature rises up to 136 degrees Fahrenheit. It's higher than in the world's most hot deserts. Michael lights his way and notices something big, white, and shiny. It's a huge crystal beam sticking out of the ground that's reaching up. The whole cave is filled with these huge things. They stretch in different directions and rest against the ceiling and the walls. Somewhere they block the path, and somewhere they are like bridges. Michael climbs onto one of the crystals and walks on it. The guide explains that each column is made of gypsum. You know this substance as it's used to produce building material, plasterboard. Michael touches the hard surface of one of them. It seems that some ancient civilization could have built it. The guide says that everything inside this cave is natural. For the first time, this place was discovered by two miners in the year 2000. Since then, scientists have managed to find out that some crystals are 500,000 years old. You can also find one of the largest natural crystals in the world here. This beam is about 36 feet long and weighs 55 tons. This place is filled with water rich in calcium sulfate. This element is capable of forming minerals. A colorless variety of gypsum prevails here. The water and warm air help form the crystals. Humidity and temperature haven't changed for centuries, so these columns continue to grow even now. This place is fascinating. Michael wants to stay here longer to explore the cave, but unfortunately, it's dangerous. 
they may get lost or slip on the gypsum rocks. Plus, they're running out of oxygen, so they have to climb back up. They come out of the cave and meet the police. It turns out that it's prohibited for tourists to enter the cave. Even scientists must get special permission to go here. And it's for a good reason, since the cave is one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Michael and the guy pay a fine and leave Mexico. The next stop is Italy. It's a good thing you've taken a good camera with you, the guide says. This is one of the most fascinating caves in the world. You need the best equipment to capture this beauty. Michael and the guide are on a small boat. They sail along the coast of the island of Capri, Italy. Luckily, there won't be any danger this time. They are approaching a small rift inside the mountain. This is the entrance to the Blue Grotto. The hole is so tiny that only one boat can pass through it. Michael and the guide get into another dimension. The cave is filled with water. The walls are shining with blue light coming from the lake's depths. Michael takes pictures of the cave and notices that the entrance they got through glows with a bright white light. It's the sun's rays illuminating the cave as they enter it. There's another hole under the water. The sunlight penetrates through it, filling the lake with a blue glow. But it's time to move on. The next cave is in New Zealand. They arrive to the North Island. There's a place deep underground with winding, intricate caves. They appeared here about 30 billion years ago. Michael and the guide approach the entrance to the dark cave. Michael turns on a flashlight. Take it away, the guy says. You won't need it inside. They come in. Michael opens his mouth in surprise. The whole cave is filled with glowing lanterns. They are all living creatures, fireflies. They're shining with a blue light. Michael feels like he's on another planet. The entrance to the cave is limited to not harm the fireflies. Scientists use automated equipment to monitor the cave. They watch the temperature and the level of carbon dioxide necessary to maintain the life of glowing beetles. If many people get here, the level of carbon dioxide will increase. The time for a visit is also limited, so they ask Michael and the guide to leave the place. Now, we're going to see something creepy, the guide says. Are you ready? And the next stop is California. The place is called Moaning Caverns. The cave seems quite ordinary from the outside, but the guide looks a little nervous and scared. They attach the rope to the belt and begin the long descent. The bottom is 165 feet deep. It's the height of a 15-story building. It seems not so big compared to the crystal cave. As Michael is going lower, it's getting cold and dark. At this point, all sounds from above disappear. They slowly sink into an ominous silence. What is it? Michael asks, startled. I think I've heard someone's voice downstairs. The guide touches his lips with his finger to keep Michael silent. A long, prolonged human moan is coming from the dark cave depths. In the first seconds, Michael freezes. Then he quickly climbs up along the rope. The guide laughs, laughs at him. They hear another moan. Michael gets out of the cave and pulls the guide's rope to get him out. The guide says this is one of the creepiest caves in the world. The air and wind circulate deep inside and create a sound similar to a moan. Tourists often go down there to tickle their nerves. Also, they found about 100 skeletons of ancient people at the bottom of the cave. And no one knows how they got there. Michael doesn't want to go back inside the cave. He asked the guide to tell him how caves form. It turns out that it all starts when the ground absorbs acid rain consisting of water and carbon dioxide. The liquid penetrates through the soil and comes into contact with hard rock surfaces. When water touches limestone or dolomite, it dissolves them and helps to form an empty space. Every year there's more and more space around. The rain continues to fall and accumulate in this open area. Then the water forms a stream or an underground river. After that, the erosion of hard rocks begins. Thousands of years later, there's enough space to fit a human here. Then this space becomes a cave. When erosion combines with stalactites and stalagmites, it forms chambers and impressive columns. By the way, here's the difference between stalactites and stalagmites. Stalactites hang from the ceiling. 
stalagmites stick out of the ground. It takes about a million years to develop such underground landscapes. So, every time you walk in these places, you come into contact with the ancient past of our planet. The sea. This unrelenting water beast has been defying all attempts to tame it for centuries. Many ships driven by the wind have gone through the harshest parts of the world. Some have survived the struggle with the sea, and many have come off second best. It's the year 1834. A ship called the Pilgrim is setting a course to sail from California to Boston. The journey will venture around South America and then past Cape Horn of Chile. Richard signs up as a merchant seaman aboard the Pilgrim. This is his first voyage at sea. The crew tells Richard stories of the Drake Passage off Cape Horn, a route that's legendary for its dangers. Countless ships and sailors have disappeared in those waters. Since Cape Horn's discovery in 1526, it's quickly become known to all those that have sailed around it as the ultimate test of any mariner's skill and of any ship's strength. Those that have survived the journey call Cape Horn a sailor's nightmare. Jack the Helmsman, a salty veteran, steers the ship towards this most dangerous of all routes. Jack has been aboard the Pilgrim since it was first commissioned in 1825. He's passed by the Horn many times, each time learning a different lesson from the tests provided by the sea. The Pilgrim has been refitted since its past voyage a year ago. Richard values Jack's experience, given that it's his first journey at sea. Jack assures Richard of his confidence in the Pilgrim, even though it's just a small wooden brig with two masts. Jack's aware that wooden vessels are gradually becoming outdated, replaced by new steam-powered ships. But Jack prefers the maneuverability of the Pilgrim and would take it over the steel ships any day. Richard is excited to be aboard. There's so much to explore in life as a merchant seaman. But the guy struggles to acquire his sea legs on the boat. Forceful winds make the Pilgrim move faster, providing Richard with a quick introduction to life at sea. At the same time, nothing can prepare him for what is to be experienced at Cape Horn. It's the southernmost point of land before Antarctica. The gap between the icy continent and Cape Horn holds the infamous Drake Passage, approximately 700 miles between Cape Horn and the Antarctic Peninsula. Strong winds provide an uninterrupted steadfast journey toward the Horn. But, as Jack tells Richard, the winds are more concentrated at the Drake Passage. They create a funneling effect, becoming stronger and more unpredictable. Richard is unsure of what this might mean for the Pilgrim, but understands that there's no easier route to travel around South America. A few days pass. The Pilgrim sails by the many islands that make up the western coast of Chile. Although the sea has been relatively calm, Richard continues to deal with his lack of sea legs. His movements are still not very graceful. The constant, ever-swaying deck rises and falls, and Richard finds it hard to get used to the motion. Random large waves hit the Pilgrim from every angle. The ship is quickly approaching Cape Horn. Richard looks towards great thunderous black clouds in the distance. Welcome to the Horn, Jack says, half laughing. A wry smile upon his face soon disappears. The man gets serious, knowing what awaits them all. Stronger winds start blowing the sails as the crew scrambles to hang onto the ropes. Richard desperately sets to adjust the aft sails, adjusting for the constant change in strong southerly winds. Jack holds firm at the helm, Knowing the importance of his role, he's wary of the swell. It can build very quickly the further south they travel. It's crucial the Pilgrim doesn't venture too close to the Horn when they approach. The great darkness that was in the distance is now all around them, filling the sky in every direction. Blackened clouds throw rain and hail down at the crew as they try to resist the enraged weather. Jack is directed by the captain at the helm, changing the direction of the vessel. The temperature has dropped significantly. Barely keeping the water from his eyes, he turns toward the port side bow to provide his face a brief break from the torment of the wind. Looking out into the distance, the man sees the horn standing alone, surrounded by mist. 
It's a haunting sight. He steers the pilgrim along the face of the horn, the distance getting shorter. The waves shrink in height since the depths become shallower. But these waves are much steeper, and their angle can cause more damage to the wooden vessel. Jack's unsure how much of these waves the pilgrim can take before the hull is breached. Richard, still posted at the aft sails, watches the water and icebergs floating by. He's unsure how large they actually are, since they're mostly hidden underwater. But he knows to alert Jack if any get too close. Just one iceberg hitting the pilgrim will be all that the hull can withstand. Dutifully, he watches over the side and into the distance. Icebergs aren't the only thing to look out for. Rogue waves are common in these seas as well. The connecting Antarctic and Pacific Oceans, mixed with stormy weather, form waves together. This creates much larger rogue waves. Such waves have been known to reach up to 100 feet tall. They can destroy most vessels in their path. It'll surely be the end of the pilgrim if it comes across a rogue wave. Strong currents adjust the route of the pilgrim, as though the horn is trying to lure the ship toward its rocky shallows. Slowly, they are getting pulled closer toward the horn. Jack is fighting the current at the helm. Spinning the wheel, he strains his body as much as he can. Grunting, he plunges the wheel from the port side to starboard and back again. The captain keeps yelling directions. To a novice, they're extremely confusing. But Jack, a hardened veteran, continues to interpret the directions with ease, steering to readjust their course away from the horn. The captain orders Richard to assess the hull below the decks. With the level of pounding the Drake Passage has provided so far, it's surely harmed the ship in some way. Richard runs to the deck as another sailor yells something at him, but the noise of the sea makes it difficult to hear. A wave hits the side, flowing onto the deck. Richard manages to hang onto the mast before he's almost swept overboard. The entire front deck seems to be underwater. Hanging on as the water rolls off the sides of the ship and waiting for it to clear, Richard watches the horn slowly go past. Still, it beckons toward the pilgrim, as though asking for its dues from the crew. The currents are still pulling the ship while the storm is raging on, with no end of the struggle in sight. The storm is growing ever larger and fiercer. Richard gathers himself to head below and assess the damage. After a slow descent to the lower decks, Richard can finally look over the hull from the ship's quarters. There's no damage from what he can gather. But he's shocked by the depth of the water inside. It's now at waist depth. Cups, amongst other things, float in the water. Even inside the ship, the guy can't escape the waves. Unable to make sense of it all, he stands frozen, listening to the almighty power of Mother Nature outside. The sea roars even more wildly, waves constantly thudding against the hull. It sounds like a somber drumbeat, a slow countdown to the demise of the pilgrim. Richard forces himself back to the terrors of the above decks, grasping onto the rails to carefully walk the slippery stairs. He leaves the disturbing creaks of the wooden decks. They're soon replaced with the strained sounds of the ropes, the yells of other sailors, and the deafening roar of the sea crashing all around him. Jack is at the helm, focused on his role, still fighting the wind and the waves, even with the addition of ice and frost. It seems that the world around him has set its heart to distract the man from his duty, but Jack pushes on determinedly. For nine days, the pilgrim fights the constant changes in stormy weather, facing all kinds of obstacles, but the ship manages to make it through. As they leave the storm behind, the crew sets their course north for their final destination. The sight of the sun peeking through the dark clouds is the most relieving thing Richard has ever experienced. Unfortunately, Richard lost his rations at some stage during the storm. At sea, if your rations are lost, it's your own bad luck. Luckily, Jack is kind enough to share some of his. Your heart is racing. You're running for your life from one of the biggest creatures you've ever seen. A giant reptile on two legs sprinting right behind you. You hear the sound of a raging river next to you, but decide not to jump in. Thick leaves and bushes keep blocking your path. 
and you keep getting stuck in the mud. Everything around you is out to get you, and there's nowhere to hide. You spot a hollowed out tree trunk and crawl inside. Whatever's out there is getting closer and closer. You hear deep guttural breathing and huge stomping. It's getting closer. You see a large tail from a crack in the tree trunk, swinging and knocking down bushes and small trees. Whatever it is, it's sniffing you out like those dogs at the airport. And right next to your face are giant bugs the size of a house cat. Perfect. You've always been scared to even look at crawly little things, but this one's so close and so big, you can actually see its facial features. It's looking at you like you're the alien. You want to scream, but can't. Then, out of the darkness, more bugs. They're curious things, flicking their antennas all over your body. Okay, this is too much. A bug is one thing, but now... A giant centipede thing is crawling your way. Its fangs are the size of your thumb. You dart out of the tree trunk and come face to face with a giant monster. It stops and stares at you, knowing you have no place to go. Claws and teeth the size of bowling pins. That's enough to keep you up at night. It's getting ready to charge right at you. Welcome to the most dangerous period and area in history for a human, the Mid-Cretaceous Sahara. This place was thriving around 100 million years ago in what would now be North Africa. Back then, the continents were all arranged differently and the weather was wild. Extreme storms were pretty common and temperatures would rise and fall like a Mexican wave at a soccer stadium. Then, sea levels started to rise. Water flooded the Kem Kem region, an area between modern-day Algeria and Morocco. Over the next millions of years, asteroids, volcanic eruptions, and other natural disasters wiped out everything else. Bye-bye, dinosaurs. Thanks for playing. You probably think of the Sahara as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. But back when it had trees and rivers, it was even more dangerous. The famous River of Giants was a huge river system that stretched from modern-day Egypt all the way to Morocco. The land was flat, and not much vegetation grew there, but it was enough for life to exist. Frightening, scary life! That creature you're staring at? It's a giant, scary-looking theropod, and it's out to get you! Imagine a T-Rex-like dinosaur that's more than 32 feet tall and has an epic jawline. <laughs> scary stuff. They were the top dogs in the food chain back then. And that's why this place and period in history was so unique. The entire area had an incredible imbalance between hungry dinos and poor little dino snacks. There wasn't enough food to go around. Scientists were never able to find much evidence of herbivores. That means it might have been a royal rumble of carnivorous creatures waiting to pounce on each other at any moment. So, after a while of having a stare-down contest with a giant theropod, a shadow creeps up on you from behind. You're too scared to turn around, but the growling is louder than anything you've ever heard. It shakes you to the core. You turn around and see a Spinosaurus. And that's about all you can see. You know how they always show the T-Rex as the king of the dinosaurs? Well, this one would be, what, the emperor? It stands about 50 feet tall and has a sail of scales on its back, the size of a regular human. Then add in a crocodile-style snout with razor-sharp teeth and some short, powerful legs. Its diet mainly consists of river fish, but it's looking at you like you're a delicious fish taco. The two alphas are now in a standoff with you stuck in the middle. But before you close your eyes and get ready to be eaten, they begin fighting each other knocking down trees. You tiptoe your way out of there and run. The further you go, the better, right? Wrong. Not here, because everywhere you go, there's going to be something dangerous. During this period, there was danger in the sky, in the water, and on land. There were small mammals scurrying around here and there, but they mostly stayed in the shadows to avoid danger. After five minutes of running as fast as humanly possible, you may get out of the forest and onto an open plain. Bad move. Now there's nowhere to hide. Suddenly, you hear another shriek. You look behind you. Nothing. It's just short grass everywhere. 
Then you tilt your head up to the sky and see what looks like a giant bird. Only these are technically flying crocodiles. There were plenty of huge pterosaurs that ruled the skies. Alanqua Saharica was a flying reptile that may have eaten fish in the river. Those fish must have been tasty. It had a huge wingspan and long slender jaws. Oh, and it was the size of a small bus. This one found you and is racing down to catch you. You run for your life, again. And this time, there's no place to hide. Suddenly, you feel talons grasping onto you and you're lifted off the ground. You soar up. If you weren't scared out of your mind, you might have noticed how beautiful the giant river channels below you are. The Alanqua maneuvers like a fighter jet, headed for the mountains, dodging all obstacles. You see a large nest with some mini beasts in it. They're hungry and as large as you. Not a great combination. You try to break free, but it's impossible. The creature drops you in the middle of the nest and flies off. You try to cover yourself, but the little ones keep pecking away. It's only a matter of time before it's too late. You look down below you and see the river. You can't tell how deep it is, but it's got a really strong current. You're out of options. You dive into the raging river and get dragged along with the current. Safe for now, ish. Imagine it's 2021. You're walking along one of the hottest and driest places on Earth, the middle of the Sahara Desert, only to find fossils of oversized fish. They ranged from bite size to bus size. Even freshwater sharks lived there. These weren't your average little fishies. Judging by their teeth, those guys meant business. You might even find a giant sea turtle swimming around. Okay, back to your wacky adventure. Luckily, you wash up on a safe sandy part of the river where you're able to relax. You drink some river water and try to find a safe place to make camp. Every noise you hear makes you jump. You sit down and try to enjoy the calmness of ancient Earth. Just when you feel you can finally catch your breath, you see a Spinosaurus walking along the river on the prowl. You run off and hide under a bush. It passes you by. You're safe. Or not. It turns, shakes the bushes and sees you. Just then, a large boom scares it away. It's the sound of you jolting awake. You turn on the light and see your cat staring at you. Those dinosaurs seem so real, probably because of that documentary you were watching right before bed. The entire mid-Cretaceous ecosystem depended on rivers for daily life. Just like all ancient civilizations, rivers were essential for the creatures of the time. And very recently, scientists discovered a new species of snakes that went extinct back then with no known descendants. To understand these ancient ecosystems, it's important to know a lot about fossils. You might find two different fossils side by side, but those animals might have lived millions of years apart. Are you a pro swimmer? Brave enough to take a dip in any ocean or sea? Bad news. There are some places you should avoid no matter how well you swim or dive. Some of these places have dangerous underwater rocks, strong currents and tides. Others are famous for legends about monsters and mysterious creatures. So let's dive into this aquatic horror show. Have you ever heard the word the strid? It's a variation of the word the stride that is used in Yorkshire. And it refers to a narrow section of the river wharf that's so small you could jump over it. But don't be fooled by its size, it's one of the most dangerous spots around. Even taking a step into the water can have dire consequences. The river wharf has a forceful current, and since the strid is so narrow, it's even stronger in that area. The intense water flow has eroded the limestone around the strid, which created hollow spaces much deeper than the rest of the riverbed. Here's the secret. The current has also weakened the banks of the strid from below. So, the ground you're standing on, admiring the rapid flow, is probably just a fragile ledge hanging over treacherous waters. There's no record of anyone who found themselves in the water of the strid and found their way out of it. And the worst part? You wouldn't even guess that this innocent looking stream could be such a danger. So my advice to you, my friend, is to stick to a safer body of water for your aquatic adventures. If you're looking for a weekend getaway in California, Horseshoe Lake is the spot for you. It's got everything. 
sandy beaches, hiking trails, and picnic areas, but wait, there's more to it than meets the eye. This lake has a dark side, namely around 100 acres of dead trees that surround it. And it's not just the trees that have been claimed by this lake. The earthquakes that hit in 1989 and 1990 unleashed carbon dioxide from under the hot magma. The gas seeped out into the air, damaging all the life around the lake. Even now, Horseshoe Lake is just as dangerous as it was 30 years ago. What makes it so scary is that the levels of this toxic gas change randomly. Warning signs that are posted everywhere certainly could give a horror film touch to a fun hike in the woods. In Kauai, Hawaii, there's a group of stunning waterfalls that used to be a popular destination for tourists. Kipu Falls, as they're called, were once the go-to spot for swimming and diving. To get to them, you had to take a long walk along a dirt path until you finally arrived at a breathtaking view of a 20-foot waterfall pouring into a crystal clear pool below. But since 2011, this area has been off limits to the public. Why, you ask? Well, there have been a lot of accidents at Kipu Falls. Obviously, jumping off the top of the waterfall would be an obvious reason for that. But in addition, there were much more mysterious cases. Witnesses tell tales of swimmers peacefully enjoying the pool at the bottom of the falls, only to be suddenly dragged under the surface. No definite explanation was found to these accidents. The locals believe that the water spirit Mo'o is to blame because it doesn't appreciate being disturbed by loud tourists. There's also a theory of a powerful whirlpool at the bottom of the pool. In any case, guide publishers do not mention Kipu Falls anymore, and trespassing is severely punished. The Samizan Hole, located in the Gulf of Thailand, is the ultimate spot for thrill-seeking divers, but it's also the most dangerous one. With a drop of 280 feet, it's the deepest diving site in the region. But its depth is not the only reason it is considered a place to avoid. The area is a major shipping zone for giant oil tankers. The strong currents around the hole make diving even more treacherous. And if that's not enough, the Samisan Hole is also home to deadly barracudas that could easily attack unsuspecting divers. The water is so murky that visibility is nearly zero, making it challenging to spot these aggressive sea creatures. All in all, the Samisan Hole is a breathtaking but extremely hazardous spot that should only be explored by experienced divers with nerves of steel. Let me tell you about New Smyrna Beach, the shark attack capital of the world. If you're looking for a relaxing vacation spot in Volusia County, Florida, you may want to reconsider this beach. The waters around New Smyrna Beach are teeming with fish, which attracts a lot of sharks. In fact, there have been so many shark attacks reported in this area that it's earned the title of the shark attack capital of the world. Even scientists have warned that if you go for a swim there, you're bound to get up close and personal with at least one of these creatures. We are talking about a distance of 10 feet, and in many cases you wouldn't even notice it. To make matters worse, the bull shark, one of the most dangerous and aggressive types of sharks, has been spotted in these waters. Once again, Kauai is on our list. The beach on Nepali coast called Hanakapiai Beach might look like heaven on earth, but don't be fooled. To get there, you have to trek through a super steep, rocky two-mile trail. There are no lifeguards on this remote beach, so even if you decide to take a dip in the water, you're on your own. The biggest threat to your safety is the incredibly strong rip currents. They are almost always present because there are no reefs to shield the shore. And if someone gets caught in one, there's no safe place to swim to for miles. The nearest safe beach is six miles away. Trust me, this beach doesn't have the best track record in terms of safety. So it's highly advised that you stay out of the water if you end up at this beach. Let me tell you about a place that looks like it's straight out of a horror movie. We're talking about Berkeley Pit, which is an artificial lake situated in Butte, Montana. The first thing you'll notice about this place is that it has an eerie blood-red color that can only be described as unsettling. You might be tempted to take a dip, but that would be a grave mistake. Don't even touch it. 
The water is extremely dangerous due to the heavy metals present in it, such as cadmium, arsenic, zinc, lead, and copper. They come from the rocks that surround the lake and make the water super acidic. In fact, this place used to be an open pit copper mine, hence its color. So if you want my advice, avoid this place like the plague. There are three lakes in Africa that maybe are the most dangerous places of all that I have mentioned so far. They're all located in Africa. Lake Monun and Lake Nyos in Cameroon and Lake Kivu in Rwanda are all like ticking timers ready to go off. They were formed over underground pools of molten rock. And sometimes this molten rock releases toxic gases like methane and carbon dioxide right into the water. When this happens, the gases can build up until they suddenly burst out of the water, creating massive waves that can wipe out everything in their path. This type of outburst is called a limnic eruption, and it can release a cloud of poisonous gas that can be harmful to everything in the vicinity. The most terrifying part? These explosions can happen at any moment with no warning. So if you ever find yourself near one of these lakes, you'd better be on high alert because you never know when the next accident might happen. Maybe you know other places you wouldn't recommend for a fun swim? Share your anti-recommendations in the comments below. Behind those huge steel doors is one of the most guarded places on Earth. It's known as Site R, or the Raven Rock Mountain Complex. You'll find it in Pennsylvania. The construction is 60 stories underground, and is said to be a safe place for people in case of a natural or human-made disaster. There's not a lot of information online about this mysterious place, but what we do know is that it's equipped with 38 communication systems. It's obviously not available for visits via Google Earth, but you can catch a quick glance at the two gates that face the complex. Vatican City is one of the most famous enclaves on Earth, and it's certainly worth a visit due to its wonderful architecture and vast list of art pieces to check out. One place, however, will always be off limits for visitors, the Vatican Secret Archives. They have some of the oldest and rarest books on Earth. These archives are available only to a limited number of people, and since they have been visited by a small number of people so far, they also trigger a lot of weird theories. For example, that there may be books proving there's life outside our planet. If you're fascinated by shipwrecks, you'll be interested to know that one of the largest wrecks you can see on Google Earth is on North Sentinel Island, India. It used to be called the SS Jassim. It was a Bolivian ferry that sank in the area back in 2003. The reason why people can't visit it physically isn't because of the ship itself, but because the island is home to the world's most dangerous tribe. We don't really know how many people live there, but it was estimated that between 50 to 400 people call this place home, and they really don't like tourists. No person that tried to reach them survived. Also, to protect them, their privacy, and their special status, the island is closely monitored by the Indian authorities. That's mostly because it's believed the locals don't have any immunity to modern diseases. So being in contact with foreigners might be dangerous for the tribe's people, since they've never seen the outer world. A huge pink bunny appeared seemingly out of nowhere in the Italian Coletto Fava Mountains back in 2005. Besides the locals, some people stumbled upon it online too. They were puzzled by the discovery. Unfortunately, that 200-foot tall bunny is completely gone today. You can still find the images of it online though. The unusual object was designed by artists from Vienna. They encouraged tourists to climb, jump, or even take a nap on top of the large rabbit. The whole purpose of the project was to allow people to experience what it would be like to live as smaller creatures. The bunny didn't have any removal date at the time it was placed there and was expected to last at least until 2025. But Mother Nature had other plans. A Japanese artist decided to move back to her little home village named Nagoro. But she soon found out that most of her neighbors were moving to bigger cities. To deal with loneliness, she started putting together scarecrow-like dolls, or kakashi, and placing them all over her garden. She didn't stop there, though. The artist soon began doing the same with many other places in her village, creating dolls and placing them as if they were taking part in various human activities. These dolls keep moving around too, but the woman likes to stay true to her story and insists she doesn't touch them. You can see the images of this quirky village on Google Maps. This weird portal was discovered via online maps in New Baltimore, New York. 
it gave people all sorts of bad dreams. With spooky looking buildings and all sorts of blurry figures, this area soon became a source for many weird internet theories. Turns out it was nothing more than a technical issue, which resulted in those images being rendered in a distorted manner. Either way, if you look for these images on Google, you won't be able to unsee them. This cute miniature world map was created by an artist from Denmark. He continuously worked on this tedious project from 1944 until 1967, using mostly his hands and just a few tools for moving heavy rocks around. He gathered stones at the edge of the water, then recreated the map of the world on the surface of this lake. During the winter, he was able to use a sled to transport larger pieces of rock over the ice and then place them in the perfect position. Apart from the continents themselves, the map also features rivers and lakes, as well as some other famous landmarks. Care to have a look at a sea without any coasts? Search for the Sargasso Sea. You'll find it in the northern Atlantic Ocean. This weird sea is surrounded by four ocean currents and no dry land at all. It got its name from the seaweed that grows there, Sargasso. Fingerprints on the lens of a satellite camera? You may be tricked into thinking this if you search for the finger maze. It's located in the city of Brighton, UK, and is a large fingerprint created in Hove Park. It also has a maze at the center. It can be really hard and time-consuming to look for wild animals on Google Earth, but the Geo Browser does have a nice feature that can help if you're eager to see hippos and flamingos in their natural habitat. Try Googling animals from above and start scrolling through these images. This unique feature can take you from Kenya to Namibia and even all the way to Antarctica, where you can see emperor penguins. There are some places on Google Maps that, for specific reasons, aren't available for the online public. Like the Royal Palace in Amsterdam. If you head over there via Google Earth, you'll see that everything around the Dutch Royal Palace is still visible, like the vegetation and roads. But the construction itself is blurred from all angles. That's probably because local authorities want to keep the unique views of the palace for the eyes of physical visitors only. The same goes for the Tantaco National Park in Chile. This one is a privately owned nature reserve that can only be seen on Google Maps from a distance. Once you reach a certain point, the zoom feature stops working. Some people say that since it's a nature preserve, it may be home to some endangered species and extreme measures are taken for their protection. You know how a certain brand of fried chicken has a certain kernel on their logo? Yeah, you won't see any of these logos in high resolution on Google Maps. That's because the online map uses specific algorithms to detect people's faces and blur them out. As you can see, it's not always really that accurate. It's called Snake Island, and the Brazilian authorities prohibit people from visiting it. For good reason. You'll find the island near the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's said to be home to over 4,000 snakes. Some of the most venomous types of reptiles on Earth call this place home. If that's not creepy enough, how about that some of them are so dangerous that a small drop of their venom can permanently damage the human skin? You can see the shape of the island on Google Earth, but the more you zoom in, the blurrier it becomes. Here's another cool thing you can do on Google Earth. Time travel. Well, at least sort of. You won't be able to travel back in time and tell yourself to study more for that tricky exam, but you can see certain historical images of places you like. You can check if this feature works by looking at the upper left corner of the screen. If you can see a small icon with a clock, it may allow you to scroll some years back. But you can also see how sunlight affects Earth if you turn on the sunlight feature. Picture a ghost town. Abandoned buildings covered in graffiti, rusting remains of cars, cracks in the roads. And now add to that a thick blanket of black smoke coming from under the ground. And the ground itself is hot to the touch. You're entering Centralia, Pennsylvania. Centralia used to be a lively place during the 1800s and up to the 1960s. Its rich coal mines attracted a lot of people to work and live there. But in 1962, one of those mines accidentally caught fire, which started to spread underground. Coal is a slowly burning fuel, so the citizens continued to live peacefully for almost another two decades until the fire began to undermine the town. One of the worst accidents was when a giant sinkhole appeared out of nowhere in the backyard of a house in Centralia. Luckily, no one was hurt, but after that, people started leaving the place. In the following 30 years, almost everyone moved out, though not all. As of 2020, five people still live there. But other than that, Centralia is by all means a ghost town. 
and crumbling abandoned buildings and cracked roads are just a minor part of it. The most disturbing thing about this place is the smoke billowing from under the ground through cracks. The fires down below are still raging, heating up the surface and slowly destroying the remains of the town. In fact, this was what inspired the famous fictional town of Silent Hill. The blaze is estimated to last for another 250 years, and by that time, there will be nothing but scorched wasteland in the area. If you're afraid of bugs, then this place will probably be your worst nightmare. The Gomantong Caves in Malaysia could be one of the most picturesque places in the world, if not for their dwellers. First off, there are bats. Over 2 million of these animals live in the vast expanses of the caves. They're easily scared, but I guess you don't want that. Millions of winged horrors flying at you in a panic aren't to be taken lightly. Secondly, there are cockroaches. And while the number of bats is more or less determined, the roaches swarming the floors and walls of the caves are unaccountable. There are so many of them that you won't be able to make a single step without a dozen of these creepers crawling up your legs. And finally, if you manage not to scream from the cockroaches and wake up hordes of bats, you might be rewarded with other wonderful dwellers of the caves. Those include snakes, scorpions, and giant venomous centipedes. Charming! Still, the caves are open to the public, and there are lots of people who visit this place. Right in the middle of nowhere in the empty wastelands of the Karakum Desert in Central Asia, there's a great hole in the ground that burns forever. It's called the Darvaza Gas Crater, and it's an actual pit, broad and deep, that has been ablaze for over half a century now. The locals call it the gate to the underworld, and the view is indeed frightening. There is no way to extinguish the flames, and scientists believe the crater will keep burning for centuries on end. The pit apparently appeared in 1971, when a group of engineers scouted the area and thought they stumbled upon an oil deposit. It turned out to be a natural gas pocket, though. And when the drilling rig started working on the site, the ground collapsed. The engineers were afraid that the poisonous gas might put nearby towns in danger, so they thought it best to set it on fire and let it burn out in a few weeks. But as we can see, the blaze is still going strong. The crater has since become a popular tourist attraction, but despite that, it still poses some danger, so efforts are being made to finally extinguish the gates of the underworld. Imagine seeing an insanely venomous snake right next to your foot. Terrifying enough, huh? And now, multiply that experience by a couple thousand times, when no matter where you try to run, there are similar snakes all around. That's Snake Island for you, and the name couldn't describe it better. The island is located not far from the coast of Brazil, and is home to thousands of golden lancehead vipers. About 11,000 years ago, the sea levels rose and separated the island from the mainland, and lots of lancehead vipers became trapped on it. Their mainland siblings are venomous as well, but not as much. The golden variety had to evolve to survive, and oh, they did. Since there's not so many land animals for the vipers to hunt, they adapted to hunting birds instead. And for their venom to be effective, it had to be instant. So, golden lanceheads developed a venom that is five times more potent than the regular variety. This helped the snakes thrive, and now there are one to five vipers per square meter of the island. It is considered so dangerous that Brazil banned all visitors, like someone would really want to go there. Lost in the woods at night, you suddenly stumble upon a human figure. Relieved, you touch their shoulder to ask for directions, but it's hard as stone and covered in moss. And then you look into the face of the person and your mouth opens in horror. It's anything but human. My advice would be not to wander around Southeast Finland at night if you don't want a shocking experience because it's here that a renowned Finnish sculptor made his eerie sculpture garden in his own backyard. The garden's main exhibition consists of 200 human figures in various yoga poses. But as you walk around, you may come across more sinister-looking works. Such as cloaked figures with its arms stretched forward and deep black gaps for eyes. Adding to the creepiness are real human teeth in the mouths of some statues. The garden itself appeared because the sculptor was a recluse and didn't want to leave his home. And when asked to lend some of his sculptures to museums, he would say he needed to ask them if they wanted to. It seems they never did, though. Creepy statues are eerie enough, but how about creepy dolls? 
If you ever find yourself in Japan and want to give yourself some chills down the spine, make sure to visit Nagoro. It's a tiny village in the south of the country. Driving by its houses and yards, you will see villagers sitting on their porches or tending to their gardens. Nothing special. Until you realize they're not moving and never will because they're life-sized dolls. One of the local residents turned her hometown in 2002 and made a hobby of creating stuffed scarecrows in gardens and fields. But then it turned from a practical thing into a sort of memorial job. Whenever any of her neighbors left the village or passed away, she would make a life-size doll in their image. She made them as she remembered them best, so all her dolls are doing something normal people would. They're sitting, standing, lying on the ground, and there are even full classrooms of dolls in the local school. But probably the eeriest thing about this installation is that the human population of Nagoro is less than 30 people, and the scarecrows outnumber the living dwellers more than 10 to 1. There are over 350 dolls in the village now. As their maker remembers, there were around 300 people living in Nagoro when she was a child, and now, for 20 years, she has been commemorating all of them. About 3,000 visitors come to Nagoro every year, and many of them return in the following years as well. The village is pretty hard to reach because it's located on one of the less traveled islands of Japan, and the nearest train station is an hour away. But that doesn't stop the tourists who want to see the wonderfully creepy scarecrows with their own eyes. A strange lake appeared in India 52,000 years ago. It was formed here literally out of nowhere. I recall it was a Wednesday. Anyway, for tens of thousands of years, people came up with various scary stories about the lake. Some locals believe this place was cursed. Others think that the lake's bottom hides the gateway to the underworld. But those are all legends. The real reason for the appearance of this Lonar Lake is even more surprising. At first, scientists were sure that the lake was an ancient crater of a long-extinct volcano. It's in a balsam field made of 65-million-year-old volcanic rock. But then, geologists conducted a detailed analysis of the soil and water and found that Lonar Lake had a space origin. Geologists found a unique glass inside the lake that forms only with a strong impact and energy release. 52,000 years ago, a huge meteorite weighing 2 million tons fell into this place. It was almost six times heavier than the Empire State Building. The striking power was so high that the volcanic rock melted and turned into glass. Perhaps the bottom of this lake still contains particles of this giant meteorite that flew to us from the distant space depths. Okay, we have a lake created by a space object more than 50,000 years ago. But even this is not the strangest thing about it. In 2020, the locals noticed that Lonar Lake had turned pink. In just a few days, the salt water mysteriously changed its color. Biologists and geologists immediately took water samples to the Scientific Research Center. The detailed analysis showed that the water contained an increased level of unique microbes. They accumulate on the surface and emit some pink pigment. Soon, these microbes settled to the bottom, and the lake became transparent again. Also, rains help the water go back to its usual appearance. These microbes color the lake and make the pink plumage of flamingos even brighter. The birds get food from the Lonar Lake and absorb these pink bacteria. Now, Lonar Lake is a popular place among tourists. But this is not the only thing that may surprise you in India. Our next stop is a small village with about 2,600 people located in a hot rainforest. The locals are very hospitable. They welcome not only tourists, but also one of the most venomous reptiles on the planet. King cobras are crawling in almost every house in this village. Locals are happy to see them as if they were their pets. People share water and food with these animals. They even give the reptiles a special corner where they can relax from the scorching sun. Ah, Cobras crawl in houses, schools, and even on the streets. Humans and reptiles are used to each other and feel safe. There has never been a case of a cobra attack in the village. It's the only place in the world where these venomous reptiles live in such harmony with people. Now, imagine a town that consists of many little united villages. The residents are all engaged in agriculture. They know how to extract water from ground rocks, and they bargain well. 
The town has been thriving for several centuries, and people live happily in it. Then, one day, everything changes. All the residents quickly pack up their stuff and run away from their homes. Overnight, the town becomes abandoned. It is a real story that happened in the state of Rajasthan in 1825. And still, no one knows why the people disappeared from there. The most popular version says that the cruel local ruler collected large taxes from the locals. Then he fell in love with the daughter of the chief of this town and threatened that he would collect extra taxes if the girl refused to be his wife. Citizens decided to support the woman and her father and left their homes in one day. This town is still empty, but the locals from the nearest cities are afraid to approach. Our next stop is the state of Maharashtra. There's a small village there with very positive people. They go to stores, cafes, schools, and banks. Everything here seems quite ordinary, and you wouldn't notice what's so special about this place. But just wait for the night to come. People go to sleep and no one locks their houses. There are no locks at all in this village. The door of any building is always open here. The owners leave the shops, cafes, and libraries open. When locals go to work, they don't lock up their homes either. They don't hide money and jewelry. The reason for this is the complete absence of thefts. The villagers are sure that anyone can get into serious trouble for stealing. According to a legend, about 300 years ago, after prolonged rains and floods, a large black stone slab appeared in the center of the village. This slab symbolized an Indian mythical creature that watched over the locals. At some point, people stopped locking their houses because they knew that no one would dare to commit theft in that creature's face. In 2015, a police station was opened here, but almost no one has reported an incident since then. The building doesn't even have doors because the police don't keep anyone there. Another fantastic place in India is a village in the state of Assam. Hundreds of locals prepare here for an unusual celebration every now and then. They arrange a magnificent wedding ceremony. They set the table, dress up in beautiful costumes, and bring gifts. And all this for the newlyweds. But instead of people, frogs get married here. Locals hold weddings for wild frogs to summon rain. The incredible thing is that the ceremony looks just like a real wedding. The fun can last all day until late at night. Now, there's one dangerous and inaccessible island in India. You can find it in the Bay of Bengal. It's called the North Sentinel. It's a small piece of land that looks like a tropical paradise. But you won't be able to get there. Since 1956, nobody can travel to this place. The Coast Guard is always sailing around and patrolling the area. The reason for this is the local Sentinelese tribe. This tribe lives isolated from the whole world. They don't know about modern technologies, the internet, or television. For centuries, the Sentinelese have lived on their own, away from civilization. And the people from India want to keep it that way. Anyone who approaches their island is welcomed by the tribe with a flurry of spears and arrows. And it doesn't matter if you're coming by boat or helicopter. Another reason why you can't get on the island is the Sentinelese immune system. The Coast Guard is trying to protect the local tribe from possible diseases and infections that outsiders can bring with them. The locals have no immunity from the flu or even a simple cold. They don't know what that is. Also, there are coral reefs and limestone around the island, which significantly complicates the passage of large ships. Despite all the prohibitions, many people tried to get to the island. In 1880, one officer accidentally discovered this island. He went ashore and found a noble soil ideal for growing coconut palms. The officer also noticed several huts on the island, but didn't dare meet the locals. Explorers and travelers presented the islanders with fish as a gift many times. The locals accepted it, asked for more, but still didn't let them approach their houses. It was also challenging to make friends with the tribe because they communicate in one of the most difficult languages to learn in the world. Scientists and linguists have been studying this language for decades. At the end of the 20th century, outsiders made some progress in building a connection with the tribe. In 1991, a team of anthropologists invited the islanders aboard a large ship. They gave bags of coconuts to tribe members. 
This may be where the phrase left holding the bag came from. Or not. Otherwise, let's just leave these folks alone, shall we? Imagine you're surfing a perfect wave, and then it suddenly freezes. Well, it sure sounds creepy, but couldn't possibly happen in real life, right? Wrong. You can see mind-blowing frozen waves in Antarctica. These waves occur when the ice gets compressed, and the ever-increasing pressure squeezes the air bubbles out. As for the beautiful blue color, it's the result of ice melting and refreezing. When the summer begins, an ordinary-looking river in Colombia transforms into a liquid rainbow. Caño Cristales, also known as the most beautiful river in the world, sparkles in five colors. Red, black, green, blue, and yellow. It only looks like this for six months of the year because the aquatic plant that gives it the bright hues needs the right water level and amount of sunshine to use its magic. Australia is home to a unique horizontal waterfall on the coast of the Kimberley region. It's really just a fast tidal flow moving through two narrow aligned rocks. The tides can rise 30 feet. The falls reverse whenever the tide changes. Also down under is the biggest single rock in the world. It's so big that it even looks like a large hill. It has a circumference of six miles and is 1,150 feet high. The edges are eroded since the rock has been around forever. These mud brick buildings are seven stories high and were built out of fertile soil, hay, and water that were made into bricks and left to bake under the sun for days. The ground floors were used for keeping livestock and grains, and the upper levels were places for socializing and catching good views. Antelope Canyon in Arizona also known as the place where water runs through rock, has two sections of slotted canyons. Throughout the years, the water running through sandstone has created a picturesque formation like no other. If you ever set foot on the arid soil of the Namib Desert in Namibia, prepare yourself for an eerie picture. You'll see countless circular patches between 6 feet to 50 feet in diameter. Organized in a honeycomb-like pattern, they stretch across 1,500 miles toward the horizon. These patches are also known as fairy circles, and you might be disappointed by the explanation of this mystery. No one knows for sure the origin of these circles, even though there are numerous theories, from the radioactivity of the soil to the activity of sand termites. Mount Haleakala in Hawaii is one of the quietest places in the world. National park managers nearly failed to find any sounds to measure here. The place translates from Hawaiian as House of the Sun. It formed thanks to a volcano that got active one million years ago. The lava flows built up over the years and grew into a mountain. It has its own climate and weather that's impossible to predict. It takes almost a week by ship from South Africa to travel to the world's most isolated settlement of Edinburgh of the Seven Seas. You'd need special permission from the local government to visit as a tourist. About 300 locals all treat each other as family, grow their own food, and keep their island impeccably clean. Daintree Forest in Australia is the oldest rainforest in the world. It has been around for over 100 million years. Daintree is home to some unique animal species, 12,000 different types of insects, and about half of Australia's frog, butterfly, and bat population. The rainforest also has around 3,000 types of plant species. Rocks that travel are called sailing stones because they seem to move across the dry lake bed of racetrack Playa in Death Valley National Park, California. As the rocks move, they leave behind a creepy trail that used to have scientists baffled. After all, some of the boulders weigh more than 660 pounds. On top of that, some of the trails are curved, while others are mostly straight, with unexpected turns to the right or the left. But eventually, 
NASA experts cracked the mystery in 2006. It turns out that in winter, the lake fills with water, covering the boulders at the bottom in ice. And since ice is pretty buoyant, underwater movements and winds make the stones move across the lake bed. In their wake, they leave bizarre tracks, only seen when the water evaporates in the summer. Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela is often called the lightning capital of the world. Thunderstorms arise here 300 days of the year, with a peak in September. Sometimes there are up to 200 flashes in a minute. It happens because cool air coming from the surrounding Andes meets with warm air from the Caribbean Sea and generates electricity. Some places on Earth have less gravity than others. Canada's Hudson Bay, for example, used to be covered by a super thick and heavy glacier during the last ice age. The ice had pushed tons of rock mass outward when it started to melt. The smaller the mass of an object, the less gravity it has. It'll take another 5,000 years for the Earth to get into its original shape in this spot. Until then, you'll always weigh less here than anywhere else in the world. Five Flower Lake in China's Zhou Jiago Valley changes its color from amber yellow to emerald green, dark jade to light turquoise, and sometimes coral. It never freezes thanks to underwater hot springs and never melts or dries up, unlike other neighboring lakes. The locals believe it's made up of pieces of a mirror that fell down from the sky. The surrounding valley has some narrow conic karst landforms, spectacular waterfalls, around 140 bird species, and giant panda along with other endangered plant and animal species. Cape Denison in the Commonwealth Bay in Antarctica is the windiest place on the planet. It has unusual downslope winds. They are formed because of the continent's dome shape and the always cold climate. These winds are so fast and strong, they ruin the measuring instruments and the masts they are attached to. The record speed so far was 200 miles per hour. The Sahara Desert, which takes up 10% of the African continent, is extremely hot and dry. That's why it's one of the top places with the clearest skies. There's hardly ever a cloud above it. This, plus the remoteness from any civilization, makes it one of the best spots for stargazing. In Denmark, people experience blackout-type effects on a pretty regular basis. Just look how weird it is. But it gets even more bizarre when you find out that birds are the cause of this unusual phenomenon. Every spring and fall, millions of starlings begin their annual migration from Sweden, Finland, and Norway toward Britain, Belgium, and France. Denmark is the lucky place where you can observe Sort Sol, the Danish name for Black Sun. The birds travel in large flocks, which makes it easier to exchange information and stay warm. Before the birds land, they perform movements that look like dancing. But in fact, they are making different formations in an attempt to shoo predators away. And although the birds fly in highly synchronized patterns, people think that the huge flock changes its shape chaotically. The dark sun lasts only 20 minutes during sunset, and you have to be either fast or lucky to see this phenomenon. The secret of the cotton candy color of Pink Sand Beach in Barbuda is the crushed corals on it and tiny single-celled red organisms living beneath them. You can see that famous shade when the waves are strong enough to wash that mix ashore. The secret of impeccable cleanliness of this place is that it has no public facilities and is less crowded than other Caribbean islands. It took thousands of years to form Picaninny ponds in Australia. This whole time, underground freshwater was slowly moving to the surface through limestone. It formed a large underwater cavern with white limestone walls. You'd need a special permit to dive here, and it's definitely worth it. Batara Gorge Waterfall has three natural bridges for anyone to walk across, take awesome pictures, and even have picnics. 
the waterfall is a result of limestone erosion that's been going on for millions of years, even though it looks like someone punched a hole right in the middle. It's located in the village of Tannerine, which is just two hours away from the capital Beirut. A village in the Meghalaya state in India is known as the wettest on the planet, according to the Guinness World Records. The average annual rainfall here is about 470 inches. It's a result of warm, moist monsoon winds coming from the Bay of Bengal, bringing clouds full of rain. It flows into rivers and waterfalls and never stops. The locals that work in the fields always wear basket-like covers to protect themselves somehow. The village of Leknes, with a population of about 3,500, is located in Norway, above the Arctic Circle. It has an unusually warm climate compared to other places in the same latitude. In January, the average minimum is 32 degrees Fahrenheit and rarely drops below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. July average temperature is 53 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty regular for many places in Europe. Puna Grasslands, Peru. A bare desert, rocky land, and one big nothing. Oh no, wait, there's Eureta. Eureta is a flowering plant that looks so unique, you might actually think it's photoshopped. That's how different it is from the rest of the desert. At first sight, it looks like some rocks covered in moss. But we're talking about a 3,000-year-old plant found in the freezing Puna grasslands of the Andes. This plant grows in packs, and they're so dense, you could stand on top of a Eureta shrub, and it'd take your weight without problems. Spotted Lake, Canada. They call it the most magical spot in Canada. In winter and spring, this is just a regular lake that looks like any other. But try going there in the summer when the water starts to evaporate. It'll feel as if you've entered a different world. A polka-dotted landscape with blue, green, and yellow spots. Over the summer, there are over 300 pools there, and they look magical. Over the centuries, people believed each of them had different healing properties. Oh, and the explanation for the vibrant colors is pure science. Each of them has a high concentration of different minerals. Rio Tinto, Spain. For more than 5,000 years, the Red River has been surrounded by mines full of copper, silver, gold, and other minerals. They give the river its unique reddish color. People were mining that area for centuries until the whole industry started to fade out. The mines remained abandoned until they were rediscovered in the 18th century. The river is quite impressive, but it's also very dangerous for people because of its high acidity. The bacteria in the water create similar conditions that can be found in some other places in our solar system. For example, scientists believe there's something similar on one of Jupiter's moons, Europa. An acidic ocean is hidden underneath the moon's surface. Toyama Bay If you're walking along the shore of Toyama Bay in Japan, you might be lucky to see mystical neon blue light. It's coming from underneath the water and lighting up the night sea. There aren't many places where you can see a phenomenon like this. It's the firefly squid that's responsible for the breathtaking show. The creature lives at a depth of more than 650 feet under the surface. But in spring, they gather near the coast. Sometimes, waves even wash them ashore. The light these animals emit is actually camouflage, which helps them to hide and protect themselves. During the day, the squids go back to the deep, but they come back to party near the shore at night. The light they produce isn't so bright you could read a book in the dark, but it's still quite impressive. Fly Geyser, Nevada, USA. Imagine you're in a space rocket. At one point, you realize you've entered the atmosphere of some unknown planet. You haven't even realized it's there. The planet's gravity starts to pull your rocket down. Soon, it crash lands on the surface. Luckily, your spacecraft is sturdy enough to stay intact. So you pull on your spacesuit and crawl outside. Right in front of you, there's something you've never seen before. Incredible nature, unbelievable colors, and a bizarre mountain-like thing. 
and suddenly it spews out a column of boiling water. You shake your head. Ah, this vivid imagination of yours. You're actually in Nevada, looking at Fly Ranch Geyser. Don't get disappointed, it's still marvelous. The geyser appeared in the 1960s when a geothermal power company drilled a hole. This allowed the groundwater to escape. And the colors similar to those you can see in Yellowstone National Park? All because of algae. Speaking of Yellowstone, that's another place that looks as if it's been imported from another galaxy. On an area bigger than the states of Delaware and Rhode Island combined, there are more than 10,000 hydrothermal features, 500 geysers, and incredible waterfalls. Singi de Bemaraha, Madagascar. Now here's the place where you can easily imagine meeting some ancient animals. You can almost see them hiding somewhere among the pointy rocks going up to 330 feet. Half of this national park is covered in forest, and the other half is rocky, formed by the erosion of water. The place is home to many animals, like chameleons, iguanas, frogs, and lots of different lemur species. Vatnajökull Glacier, Iceland On your quest for the extraterrestrial wonders of our planet, don't forget to drop by Iceland. There, you'll find the biggest glacier in all of Europe. In some places, the ice can be more than 3,000 feet thick. Vatnajökull has 30 outlet glaciers ready to be explored. Those are channels of ice that once flew out of an ice cap, but remain stuck within the borders of the valley. As for famous Icelandic ice caves, they're formed when meltwater runs through a glacier trying to get to the surface. This usually happens in the summer when temperatures are higher and the water flow is more turbulent. When the temperatures go down, the water freezes. That's how the caves are shaped. Staffa, Scotland, UK Staffa is an uninhabited island that looks like a place from a different planet. Once you see it, you can't shake off the feeling it hides plenty of secrets. In reality, though, it's a calm spot, almost completely taken over by seabirds and seals. Even so, no one can argue that the incredible rock columns give this place a unique and mysterious look. It's always encouraged local people to spread legends about the unusual cave. The columns themselves formed millions of years ago, mostly because of volcanic eruptions. Glowworm Caves in New Zealand Imagine finding an entrance to a magical cave. You row your boat, eager to sneak a peek inside, and get rewarded with one of the most beautiful views ever. You see a closed cave that looks as if it's under a magnificent starry sky. You don't need to travel all the way around the Milky Way to find something like that. Glowworm Caves in New Zealand are there for you. The caves started forming millions of years ago, and now they have an impressive collection of stalagmites and stalactites. But what makes them really special is glowworms. The caves are home to thousands and thousands of luminescent larvae. Worms need to attract insects and potential partners. To do that, they use their tails that glow in the dark. There are lots of caves like this in the area, and people have been exploring them for over 100 years. Wulingyang Scenic Area, Zhangjiaji, China. This amazing place has breathtaking sceneries and more than 3,000 sandstone pillars. They look as if nature decided to make its own version of skyscrapers. Some of them are half as tall as the Empire State Building. Usually, you can't even figure out where the pillars start. All you see when you try to make out what's there at the bottom is endless mist. Two natural stone bridges seem to be floating among the pillars lost in the clouds. The Eye of the Sahara That's a mystery that's remained hidden for millennia. This geologic formation is difficult to spot when you're standing on the ground. That's why it wasn't discovered until people started to explore space. For some time, scientists thought it was an impact crater created by some space object hitting Earth's surface. But after doing the research, they found out the origin of the eye was entirely Earth-based. These days, geologists believe the eye's formation started over 100 million years ago, when plate tectonics were pulling apart the supercontinent Pangaea. Molten rock 
which was rising toward the surface, created a massive dome made up of different layers. Later on, volcanic activity and erosion finished the eye's look. Baikal Lake, Russia The deepest, the oldest, and one of the biggest freshwater lakes in the world is bound to have some secrets of its own. The lake is frozen from early January to May. In the summer, the water is so clear you can see up to 130 feet down. That's because melted ice from the Siberian mountains is incredibly pure. There are also no mineral salts in Baikal. Salar de Uyuni, Bolivia It's one of the most extreme places in South America. The world's biggest salt flat stretches for over 4,000 square miles. It appeared when prehistoric lakes evaporated thousands of years ago. A thick, salty crust extends beyond the horizon. At one point, you're not even sure where the land ends and the sky begins. The Atacama Desert, Chile The world's driest desert is all about rocky landscapes, salt lakes, dunes, and extreme temperatures. In some parts of the desert, there's been no rain for almost 500 years. With no water or nutrients from the ground, there are no plants. That's one of the reasons why you might feel as if you're on another planet, like Mars. But wait for the night to fall. An infinite sky full of stars looks like a window to the universe and its mysteries. The Avenue of the Baobabs is probably the most incredible and surreal avenue in the world. To see it, head to Madagascar. It's not the only giant thing you can find there. This island is also home to huge comet moths. Their wingspan is crazy, up to 8 inches. So you don't even need to look for iffy bottles with drink me signs on it to significantly shrink in size. Wakuchina looks like an oasis in the middle of a desert. Oh wait, it actually is a desert. But unlike many others, it has a bunch of clubs and bars. A fun thing you can do there is sandboarding and even bodyboarding. Make sure you've got the glasses on and your mouth's tightly closed. The Tunnel of Love in Cleveland, Ukraine is completely covered with plants. Some couples believe that if they go through this two-and-a-half-mile-long tunnel together, their dream might come true. Be careful what you wish for, though. There are trains going through this tunnel three times every day. The dark hedges in Northern Ireland seem a bit creepy because of the legend that surrounds this alley. The locals say the road is haunted by the ghost called the Grey Lady. By the way, guess what TV show was filmed here? In northern Portugal, there's a wonderful house that looks like a prehistoric building, almost like a cave, but it's an actual cottage. It's called Casa do Penedo, which literally means boulder house, and it's a tiny museum now. From far away, it looks like a huge stone and a perfect dwelling for some mysterious creature. Another such abode is in Italy, somewhere in the middle of Rishenzi. It's an artificial lake created as a result of flooding. This place is famous for its 14th century church standing right in the water. So the only time you can get there on foot is in winter, when and if the lake freezes over. One lake you can definitely take a stroll on is Baikal. No wonder, located in the heart of Siberia, it freezes over every winter. It's so large that it has 27 islands on it. It's also the deepest lake in the world, reaching almost 5,400 feet. Off to hot waters. Grand Prismatic Spring in Wyoming is the largest spring in the U.S. and the third largest water source of this kind in the world. Don't you dare swim there! Not only is it boiling hot, you'll also have to face a fine for that. Enjoy it safely on the shore. Mont Saint-Michel in Normandy, France is a top fairy tale destination if you ever wanted to feel like a prince or princess. The magnificent castle is surrounded by water, but not all the time. It all depends on the moon. The highest tide can be seen 36 to 48 hours after a full moon. When I was there, I saw only a deserted area with a few puddles. A night sky with thousands of stars has those romantic vibes. But the literal sea of stars probably has even more. 
Welcome to the Maldives' Vathu Island. The beaches here glow blue at night, thanks to the bioluminescent plankton in the water. You didn't think these were real stars, did you? If the stars don't interest you that much, you'd likely like the sky full of balloons. Cappadocia, a region in Turkey, is originally famous for incredible rock formations, but it also attracts visitors thanks to its wonderful hot air balloon experience. For those who always wanted to walk on clouds whenever they peeped out of the window on a plane, good news, guys! You can do just that in Bolivia. It's not a literal cloud, but an extremely large salt tile. It's called Salar de Uyuni, and it mirrors the sky during the wet season, creating that illusion of infinity and walking on the sky. In Colombia, make sure to visit the Las Lajus Sanctuary. To get to the church itself, you'll need to cross a bridge that seems to be hung right in the air, and there's some fast-flowing water underneath you. Well, we're back in France. It's Colmar Alsace region, and just look at these houses. Colorful facades made of timber, canals all adorned with flowers and cobblestone streets. Germany is full of cities with these cozy gingerbread houses, and Rothenburg ob du Tauber is not an exception. It's an almost fully preserved medieval town with dozens of multicolored facades and authentic taverns. It looks especially magical in winter, with snow-dusted roofs and awesome holiday markets. In Iceland, many houses have grass roofs. Such dwellings are called turf houses, and grass on top of them has multiple functions. It not only decorates, but also protects houses from heavy rains. The grass grows in the foundation made of lava rock and needs regular trimming. In Costa Rica, on the islands of Isla de Caño, there's an assortment of about 300 circular objects of different sizes. Locals call them las bolas, which is simply the balls in English. These stones have an almost perfectly round shape. Some of them are huge, weighing up to 16 tons each. They're also made of different materials – gabbro, limestone, and sandstone. They're considered to have been put in lines in front of the chief's houses. Nobody knows for sure where those balls came from, but some myths claim they originated from Atlantis. A place called Angel Fall speaks for itself. It does look idyllic. It's the world's tallest uninterrupted waterfall, many times taller than Niagara Falls. The water falls in cascades and much of it evaporates on its way down, which creates an illusion of those beautiful clouds. If you're into dazzling shine, try visiting the Grand Crystal Cave in Mexico. You can only do so under professional supervision, but it's definitely worth it. Chances are you've never seen a crystal twice your body size. In Morocco, there's a town called Chefchaouen in which the prevalent color is sky blue. Not azure, not cornflower blue, and not turquoise. Most dwellings there are painted the most beautiful shade of blue you've ever seen. The place is not easily accessible. It's located in the Rif Mountains. One more sky blue place is Santorini, which is probably a bit more easily accessible. The dwellings are painted white, but almost all the roofs are of a vibrant blue shade. The white paint is to keep the heat away and make sure you've got the most Instagrammable location. In Slovenia, don't forget to visit one of the world's most spectacular spots, Lake Bled. The color is truly aquamarine. Nope, it's not photoshopped. Right in the middle of the lake, there's a cliff which is actually a small island. There's a castle and a couple of other dwellings too. To sweeten the trip even more, try a piece of bled cream cake baked with a secret recipe. When you first see a photo of Moraine Lake in Canada, you'll probably believe it's either photoshopped or painted by a professional artist. But this place is real, combining a myriad of blue shades that feel so idyllic you don't want to ever leave here. Bagan, the mysterious land located in Myanmar, has all the ingredients to be a truly out of the fairy tale spot. You can enjoy all the exotic vegetation, misty mountain landscape, and numerous temples riding a bike, or you can see it from a hot air balloon. 
The Philippines have a bunch of things to see, but there's definitely something special about local beaches. If you ever go there, the hidden beach in the El Nido itinerary is the perfect place to enjoy some solitude. The beach is securely protected from boats and unwanted weather conditions by limestone coves. In the Italian region of Liguria, there's dozens of precious beaches you'll never forget. Bay of Poets in Porto Venere is one of them. The beach is located right on the cliff, and there's also underwater caves you can swim into. It's called Bay of Poets because the legend says Byron got inspired there, swimming across the bay in search of his muse, which he eventually found. The area Cinquateri is in Liguria too, and is really close, so if you always wanted to see those Italian cliffs and sea wallpaper in real life, head there. The legend has it that seamen would paint their houses bright colors to find the way home easier. The Isle of Skye, Scotland, could be a perfect decoration for some historical TV show about proud knights and their maidens. There are also probably some fairies in the fairy pools in Fairy Glen. The must-see here is the Old Man of Stor, a hill that combines rocky and steep sides. There are no legends or anything, but it's one of the most inspiring and photographed areas on our planet. At first sight, if you take a look at it from the land, it'll seem just a stone bridge. But its main secret is to look at it from the water. The bridge reflection forms a perfect circle that looks like some sort of a portal to a hidden underwater world. It's located in Saxony and is just a short drive from Berlin or Dresden. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these